a grave going to hold the Lord Jesus Christ now. He is risen. And no grave is going to hold the bodies of those who know him as Lord and Savior now either. One day, one day the dead in Christ shall rise. And we look forward to that day. We celebrate the resurrection of Christ this morning. We're going to go ahead and dismiss for Children's Church. We said we have Children's Church this morning, I believe. So if anyone can eat. Body about eight, eight and under roughly. We can go on down with this Cindy. Everybody else, turn your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. This is where we're going to be this morning. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Luke, chapter 24 this morning will be the text. Our title this morning, this morning's message, What Our Risen Lord Gives to His People. Notice I did not title it, What Our Risen Lord Gave to His People, but What He Gives to His People. He still gives. His resurrection still gives us so much that we need to understand and be thankful for and live out, live out in our lives what our resurrected Lord has given us today. So let's stand in the honor of the reading of God's Word from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 49. Please turn your Bibles and find Luke, 30, Luke chapter 24, verse 36. We're going to read all the way to verses, verse 49. Luke 24, 36. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still did not believe for joy and marvel, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of a boiled fish and some honeycomb. And he took it and he ate it in their presence. Imagine that. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And then he opened up their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from all power. So Almighty God, we thank you for these your words of truth. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are our risen Lord. and You spoke to your disciples some 2,000 years ago, but all these words are still so relevant to us today, the church today, what you give us. And Lord, you do not want us to be ignorant of these things. For oh, what we miss out on. When we don't know, when we don't know what you've given us, Lord, I pray you would help your people to understand and help me, Lord, to tell them accurately, to preach to them, Lord, with love, with conviction, and Holy Spirit, above all, with grace. And Lord, we pray you would help us, for we need you. We acknowledge our need for you. And we pray these things, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. So a little bit of context. The disciples had turned from... 
turn from the road to Emmaus, and they were they seen the risen Lord, and they finally got it when he disappeared from their sight. And they came back, hey, the Lord's risen indeed. He's also appeared to Simon, this Peter. And they were talking about these things that happened on the road and how he was known to them and the breaking of bread. They were telling about all this stuff and that happened to them. And then, verse 36, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself was standing there in the midst of them. Well, how did he get it? Standing right there beside of them in their midst. And he says to them three words. Peace to you. Peace to you. Three words. The risen Lord gave his followers first. What? Peace. Okay, peace. May peace be upon you. May peace be with you. Do you know that he still gives his people peace today? The Lord Jesus Christ, when he died upon the cross and he rose again from the dead, he gives his people first peace with God. Peace with God. Look at your outline at Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus gives us peace with God our Father. He said, my Father and your Father. He has not only redeemed us, He's also reconciled us. All people who come to faith in Christ, they're no longer enemies of God. They're no longer estranged to God. They are friends with God. They are sons and daughters of God. They have peace with God. Do you have that peace with God today? Can you, can you honestly say, I have total peace, total tranquility, total assurance that God is my Father, that I am His Son, I am His daughter. Do you have that peace with God? It's only available through Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's only one way for peace with God. I pray all of you have that peace, but I don't know. And I can't make that decision for you. Do you have peace with God? It's only available through Jesus Christ. You have to believe that He died for your sins, that He rose again from the dead, and that He is your Savior, and you have submitted to Him as your Lord. If you have that, then you have faith in Him. You have peace with God. I hope none of you walked in here this morning thinking, well, I, I hope this gives me some good bonus points with God. I came to church on Easter Sunday. Hopefully, Lord, you remember. That's not peace with God. I hope all of you come into this house this morning knowing you are a son or a daughter of God. Knowing that you know your Father in heaven. And He knows you. There's no doubts about that. If you truly have peace, there should be no doubt about that. You shouldn't be doing things to try to, to get bonus points or try to somehow do works that appease God, hoping that He won't be as angry with you. No. Peace that Jesus Christ offers is total, complete, perfect peace with God, your Father, our Father. If you're a Christian today and you know that you are, what about peace of God? peace of God. you got peace with God, but does the peace of God dwell in your life? Look what Jesus said in John 14, 27. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. If you have the peace of God, you're not troubled. You're not afraid. You're not worried. You're not anxious. Oh, pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what the doctor said. You don't know what my daughter said to me this week. You don't know what my son said. You don't know what, where my grandkids are. How can I have peace? Hey, Jesus said, peace, peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give to you. And I don't give like the world gives. You know how the world gives peace? Have you thought about that? The world gives it conditional. Right? It's all conditional. 
Well, based upon the circumstances of your life, you might have peace today, but not tomorrow. Jesus said, I don't get peace like that. My peace I give to you. My peace I give to you. I leave it with you. And not as the world gives do I give to you. So my peace is permanent. And it resides with you because I reside with you. No matter what you're going through, what did Jesus promise? The last words he said in the Gospel of Matthew, I will be with you even unto the end of the age. That's a promise. Jesus is with you. And if you have Jesus, you have his peace. Oh, but the world wants to take that away, don't it? Your flesh wants to take it away. The evil one definitely wants to take it away. All the time, whispering those lies to you. Oh, if God, if God loved you, Dean, you wouldn't be going through this. If God was your, what kind of father is he to allow, to allow one of his children to go? How's God good? Preachers say God's good all the time. All times God, God is good. Is that really true? The evil one whispers that it's not. But we have to cling to the truth of the word of God. The peace of God. Peace of God. Oh, it surpasses all understanding. Those of you who have been through the trials, the fiery trials with God, you know about that, don't you? You know that peace that surpasses all human understanding because it's not something that you can explain. It's something that you know is true because it resides within you. And it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what you're facing. That peace stays with you and it never leaves you. Because it's a peace that Jesus gives. And he's left it. Oh, I hope, you're, I hope you're experiencing that peace. Because the evil one comes to do what? Steal. Steal, kill, and destroy. He loves to steal, kill, and destroy your peace. Don't let him do that. Don't let your flesh do it, and don't let the world do it. Peace with God is precious. Also, we see that we have peace that makes us complete. They say, peace that makes us complete. What are you talking about, Pastor? Look at Hebrews 13, 20, 21. The Bible says this. Now may the God of peace, the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will. Let me read that again. Make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Peace that makes us complete. I've got peace standing before you this morning. I've got peace preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do I, do I get anxious sometimes when I'm preparing a message? If I let my flesh get away, yeah. But I'm at total peace before you. You know why? Because I know God is working in and through me. He's working in and through me. This is what He has called me to do, what He's equipped me to do for His glory, for His purposes. So I got peace about that. I'm complete. I'm doing what He has made me to do. I don't guess He's called any of you to do this, but what has He called you to do? What is He calling you to do? Do you have peace about it? Do you have the peace that makes you complete in every good work to do His will? Not only that you're not doing it for yourself, but you're doing it for Him. And that He's working in you what is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ for His glory. Do you have that peace in your life? That, hey, your life, your life is a testimony of the goodness of God. Your life is a testimony of your faith in Jesus Christ. And you are His workmanship. God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus Four good works that God has even prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. Yeah, it's our choice. We need to walk. We need to walk and follow the good works that God's prepared for us. Do you have that peace? That comes from Ephesians 2, by the way. 8 through 10. Do you have that peace? You're, you're, you're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Four good works that God has prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. Hey, peace that makes you complete. Also, many people are out there looking for themselves. <laughs> Think about that. I'm trying to find myself. You ever heard anybody say that to you? I'm trying to find myself. 
Oh boy, you're trying to find yourself, you're going to be looking for a long time. A very long time. Because if you're trying to find yourself, you're on the wrong track. You need to find Jesus Christ. You need to find Jesus Christ and have life through Him. Then you'll be complete. And then you'll be able to walk in those good works. Complete peace. Know what you were created and designed to do. Do you have that? That's what the Savior offers. He offers it to you. Are you, are you walking in this good work? Maybe you need some understanding. That's the second thing our Lord offers us. Our risen Lord gives us understanding. Verse 24, 24 through 48. Look at this. He said to them, after he ate that, you know, piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb in front, you know, just say, hey, I'm not a ghost. I'm not a phantom. I got flesh. I got bones. It's a bodily, physical resurrection. It's me. It's me, myself. Hail me and see. Then he said to them, Maybe after you swallowed that last piece of honeycomb. Maybe drink a little bit of water. I don't know. These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. That all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And then he opened up their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. The Lord Jesus Christ also gives us understanding. Understanding. Comprehension. Now, he gave his disciples here understanding of the Old Testament Scripture. And I just listed a few of them. I'm not going to go over all of them, but they are not comprehensive. Subpoint A, a point number two is not comprehensive. These are the main ones. There are many, 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 many more. But Jesus undoubtedly unlocked all of the prophecies and the law of Moses and the Psalms of the prophets concerning his death and resurrection to his disciples. There you go. Now, they have to get us some more? Yeah. But at least they understood, hey, it, it's written in the Old Testament. Okay, you were to die. You were to rise again from the dead. Okay, we understand that. What about us today? Do we understand it? You may be thinking, well, I'm no pastor, I'm no, no theologian. Does it really matter? You, you can look up all these Old Testament scriptures and understand that it had to be, it was written and it had to be fulfilled. But what about us today? What about us here in the 21st century? We say, well, we, we understand. It was written. Thus it was written. Thus it was necessary. Okay, the Christ would suffer, rise again from the dead. Verse 46, thus it is written. Thus it is necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. But you know what else is written? And what else is necessary for us today? Hey, don't miss this, church. Look at verse 47. Look at it very carefully, verse 47. Jesus said, and that. In other words, thus it is written also, and, and that is necessary. Look at verse 47. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. It's written and it's necessary. And that's what the church is still doing today in the year 2024 on March 31st right now. That is our mission and that's what we're supposed to be doing. That is what Jesus has commanded. <laughs> that is the understanding he wants us to have. I wonder if the church truly understands verse 47. I wonder if, they truly, if we truly understand verses 48. Do we truly understand that it is written and is necessary that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem? And, and we're simply witnesses. Just like the disciples, we're witnesses of these things. You know, I, I hope that you believe that Jesus rose again from the dead. I really do. I hope that's why you're here. You believe he died on the cross. You believe he rose again from the dead. You sang the song. Maybe you said amen. Maybe you clapped. You believe that. And you're a witness of it. You're a witness. You know, a witness is simply someone who honestly testifies to what they have seen and what they've heard. That's a witness. And Christians are witnesses who testify of Jesus Christ and simply tell sinners how to be saved. That's what Jesus wants us to understand today. 
But sadly, today in the year 2024, not only in America, but I believe around the world, but also in America, there are some churches that seem so simple, so evident. You're like, I mean, you know, you're like, duh, pastor, I know this. But so, so many Christians have, have lost track of what the church's mission really is. Hey, the church, the church is not a militant organization to be used by man to promote man's ideas or man's image or man's purposes, political or otherwise. That's not the church's mission. The church's mission, look at verse 47. The church's mission is that repentance and remission of sins is to be preached or testified of or proclaimed or heralded in the name of Jesus Christ to all nations beginning at Jerusalem and to be witnesses of this. That's our mission. You know how many people, the experts estimate that there were around the whole world, the world population in, in the time of Christ? They estimate 300 million people. That's less than the people in the United States right now. What, what is our nation up to? I know it's hard to keep track of. But 350, 360 million? There was, there was less people in the whole entire world, experts predict, in Jesus' time there was in the United States. How many people are in the world today? Over 8 billion and counting. How many more nations, how many more countries are there in the world now than there were in Jesus' time? We don't know, do we? Was the United States a nation? Some of you are like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, if you failed seventh grade history, the answer is no. How many more nations, how many more people are there in the world today than there were in Christ's time? But hey, the gospel's still going around the world, isn't it? Hey, what, what are we giving to the Annie Armstrong history? offering to promote North American missions because there's people in, in, in America and in Canada that ha haven't heard the gospel. Much less around the whole world. But the mission goes on. The mission goes on. But oh, there's still, there's still people who, who, who want to take the church and, and militarize it and use it for this purpose, you know, and that purpose. And Hey, we got to stick to what Jesus said. Just be witnesses. Just be witnesses. Testify that repentance and remission of sins be proclaimed to all the nations around the world. That's the church's mission. So, what human being is really, really up to that task? You may think, I'm not. Oh, we're not. What are we? 80 people here? How many, how many, how many disciples? 11? How many in, in Acts chapter 1 that was gathered in the upper room? 120, not much more than what we are today. But think about what they did. Think about what they did. They started the church and that has grown around the whole entire world. And right now, on Easter Sunday, there are untold tens of millions of people gathered in houses of worship from little old bitty huts to great big cathedrals proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus Christ but it all started with this little bitty group of people. You ever thought about it? It's amazing. You know why it's amazing? Because God did it. God did it. And how did he do it? The same way he does it today. He has given us the third point is the most important one. He has given us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Look, if you will, at verse 49. Behold, he tells his disciples, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. You know, the Holy Spirit is referred, referred to as the Spirit of Truth. Jesus calls it the Spirit of Truth, Him the Spirit of Truth in John 16, 13. But also the Spirit of Promise in Ephesians chapter 1. And here in Luke 24, He is the Spirit of Power. And do with power from on high. Power that only God can give. Verses 47 and 48, they don't describe something that we do for the Lord. But rather something that the Holy Spirit does through us. Sometimes, sometimes we, 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 we think, oh well, I witnessed, I witnessed for the Lord today. I witnessed for the Lord today. 
I witnessed to somebody. I shared the gospel. I, I shared the gospel with somebody. And we think it's, it's a task or, or something we can check off our to-do list and, you know, will we'll make us feel better and less guilty. And it's something that we do for the Lord. Hey, verse 49 teaches it's something the Lord does through us. It's something He does through us. It's, only, it's, only, it's something only God can do through us. Sharing the truth that there is repentance and there is remission of sins and there is hope and there is salvation in Jesus Christ. That's something only the Holy Spirit can do. Because after all, as Vance Havner said, look at this. People do not come to faith in Christ at the end of an argument, but rather through a spirit-empowered witness. You ever known anybody to come to faith in Christ because you out-argued them? Well, I won the argument. Well, whoop it, he did. I showed him who was boss. People come to faith in Christ through a spirit-empowered witness. Now in John chapter 1, Andrew, do you know Andrew was a brother of Simon Peter? And Andrew went and told his brother, Peter. We all know who Peter is, right? He's a disciple that always opened up mouth and insert foot. But Andrew was the one that went to Peter and said, Hey, I found the Messiah. I found the Messiah. Come and see. Took him to Jesus. Why did Peter go? Because of his brother's witness. Then you have Philip and Nathaniel. Philip, Philip told Nathaniel, Hey, Nathaniel, we found the one spoken of by Moses, spoken of by the prophets. We found the promised one, the anointed one. The Messiah has come. It's Jesus of Nazareth. Nathaniel. Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> really? The Messiah come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know what Philip told him? Come and see. Come with us. Power of a witness. Power of a witness. Oh, Pastor, are you making me feel guilty because I have a witness to somebody? I know all about that witness and stuff. Hey, it's what the Holy Spirit does through you. Not what you do for the Lord, but what the Holy Spirit, what the Lord does through you. You can be a witness. You can be a witness by your testimony, by your life, and also by your words. But only if you yield to the power of the Holy Spirit and trust in His power. Because if you try to do it in your own strength, you're going to probably end up in a big argument. And you might win the argument. But you're not going to lead anybody to faith in Christ. <laughs> because I have a feeling that most of you, I hope all of you, this morning, how did you get here? Well, I drove. I don't mean that one. How'd you get here? Why are you here? Did somebody witness to you? Did somebody witness to you? Did somebody? Surely somebody told you about Jesus Christ. Somebody did? You know who they were? You remember? Did they out-argue you? Did they out-debate you? Did they pull out their big old study Bible that's about that thick, point to you all the theological reasons, or did they just say, I know a Savior who's paid for my sins and redeemed me and lives within me and loves me and I'm a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And you knew their witness was true. 
Would you be that witness? Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word and the life of your son, Jesus Christ, and his word. And Lord, what, what you give to us, Lord Jesus, what you give to us right now, peace, peace, understanding, keeping us on track of what we're to do, what our mission is, and the greatest gift of all, the gift of the Holy Spirit. But you have made clear in your word that we receive when we turn away from our sins and trust in you as Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and resides within us, comforts us, comforts us, teaches us, and empowers us to speak the truth, the truth of the gospel. And Father, I'm thankful for this Resurrection Sunday for what we refer to as Easter. This year it falls on March 31st. But Lord, whatever the date is on the calendar, the truth remains that you rose again from the dead. And it was written, and it's necessary, that repentance and remission of sins be preached in your name, starting at Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. And it's written and it's necessary. The, this must take place and it's been taking place for the last some 2,000 years. But one day you're going to come again. When the harvest is complete, no one knows that time. No human being knows. But when the harvest is complete, Lord Jesus, you're going to return. You're going to return. As King of kings and Lord of lords, I pray we're ready. I pray we're all ready. I pray everyone right here in your house is ready. And Lord, we all want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. We all want to hear that. Holy Spirit, I pray we would all yield to you and walk in you and be witnesses of who we are in Christ and what Christ has done for us. And now as we enjoy the Lord's Supper, communion, because we're a community, I pray that you would be with us. But Lord, I'm going to take just a moment or less, a moment or less, for everyone to have a quiet moment anyone has turned from their sin and turned to faith in you, Lord Jesus, if they've made that decision now. Maybe they've drifted away from you and they want to come back like the prodigal son. They've returned to you, Lord. I pray. They will come forward and speak to me on the front row. I just want to pray with them so they can have their heart and their mind and their soul ready to receive communion this morning. If anyone needs to come, May they come before we have communion, I pray. You lead them, Holy Spirit. You lead them as we worship and sing. For a short while, we pray. 